And let me share my slides with you for those online. So uh, this, this course is in with all our other courses that are online. You can't really see them so good maybe, but these are the courses that are online from ranges from uh, emotions to uh, marriage to this conflict class to parenting to hope. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, becoming more trained in biblical counseling, we have what we call the step up package. And if you go along the left side of your screen, you go to our online school, which is uh, at lcbcc.org, lcbcc.org, you can go there, Low Country Biblical Counseling Center, lcbcc.org, and just go to our online school that's under training tab, and you'll get this. And uh, click on that step up there, because that's, we, we try to keep it very reasonable. But again, if you don't have funding, we work with people as they are. $25 a month allows you to uh, take what we call the step up package, which is the change that sticks the foundations course. Five modules, eight, nine months. If you spend two hours a week, if you do want to do more, get it done quicker. That's great. You can study uh, ahead of the class. But right now uh, you can enter the modules uh, as they begin. So like we're doing module five now, it's like, well, I want to start module one. Well, you can start module one next year, but stay with us because it doesn't, it's not sequential necessarily. You can pick up each module as they come. So the step up course is the best because then you can go from there into everything else that's needed to begin to get certification and biblical counseling and, and move into the next thing, which is an exam class. Uh, we also have other options. One is a, uh, uh, the counselor mentorship program that gives you a meeting a month uh, with myself to talk about what you're learning, cases you're going through, resourcing you on things that you're doing, as well as you get to be a part of a biblical counseling network, which you get to ask questions of, of some of the national biblical counselors that we have once a month online, be part of that. We've had a Martha Peace, we've had a, a Ken Sandy, um, some others, and we're gonna soon hopefully have Robert Jones from Southeast, well, Southern now, and um, Lou Criolo. Uh, so there's a lot of benefit to that. But one of the things that you, some churches are going beyond just counselor mentorship, to ministry development. And that's our kind of biggest package where I meet twice with you or your team. And we talk about case resourcing. And I do th some events at your church if necessary to help stir the pot up for what's going on uh, what, in the church and what can go on in scripture. Um, so the other thing that you get, uh, you can actually subscribe to this. This is $10 a month. On the top of right, you can see Pro Resource Library on our website. This is our website, lcbcc.org. You can go to the training tab and go to our online school or over here, the resources tab uh, and go to, I think I just destroyed my, no, nope, still there, good. Uh, you can go to the resources tab. And when you go to that Pro Resource Center and sign up for it, if, if you're part of the, the uh, counselor mentorship program, you get it this free as, some other benefits too, but you can also just access this $10 a month. It gives you all these resources on the left. These, these, there's about 700 different uh, handouts, uh, outlines from courses like this as, as there. Um, I often use this for my counseling. Like what I just presented, I will give to a couple sometimes that's in conflict and say, I want you to listen to this. Sometimes I'll have them sign up for the whole course, but sometimes I'll just go to our media store online and just find that one and say, I want you to watch that one. Here's the outline. Well, how do you give them the outline? Well, if you, if I searched anger, for instance, I get this and the list goes down. So these are all the anger assignments. And so I can click on one of these and I did click on it earlier to take a shot. This is seven questions to reprove. This is on James four. What's the source of quarrel? So this is an assignment. I can print it or I can email it out. And this one, I decided to email to my wife. <laughs> her, her email's on there. Oh, goodness. I just gave everyone online her email. <laughs> Whoops. Let's move on. Now we'll have a conflict over that. Yeah. So anyway, we, we're, we try to put everything we can in the hands of church godly Christians to use to minister to others. Um, 
because you can be these things to people in your life. And one of the hardest things is to get the source to meet the need. The source is there. God has what we need, but the need is here. And sometimes preaching, church ministry gets us to the need, to the source. That's good. But sometimes there's this not getting to the source. And that's where biblical counseling can personalize and intensify what you need to hear because you're going through something. And so we're taking what the pulpit is saying and putting it into shoe leather for that person in an inspiring way, sometimes confrontive way, hopefully gently. Uh, I say, if there's any way to say something, I want to say it in the most kind way, but I have to say it. So what I often have to start with is what do I need to say? Now, how do I say it? You know, that's uh, you season it with salt, as it says in Colossians. So if you want to be a part of that training, go to the step up on our online resource center um, and be a part of that. We have about 100 students now plus in our online school. Some of them are from Miami, some from Charleston, one couple from overseas. And uh, we're doing a lot of things as we try to help people. So. Um, all right. So we're going to go to this page. Um, I think I may have gotten the, I sure did, didn't I? Guys, I got the wrong one up. Just give me a second. I'll get the right, right uh, PowerPoint up in just a second. Just give me a quick second. There it is. This is the one we want right here. All right. All right, thanks for your patience. I think we got it now. All right. Now, why am I in the middle of that, huh? Let's move that out of the way. It still didn't move out of the way, did it? Let's do this all over again. Glad you guys are learning patience here. Uh, this is it right here. This is the one we want. Okay. I'm going to get rid of this altogether. Lift this up like that. We're going to end this, start it over. And I think we'll be in business now. Yeah. Now I got to share my screen with you guys and we'll move into humility here. And I'm still showing my face. What is going on here? That didn't happen before. Hmm. All right. Hmm. 
can stop the share one time. All right, guys, thanks for bearing with me here as I get this going. All right, good. I think we're doing well now. All right, great. So we're gonna look at page 13, as I have been saying. And um, notice what James ended with, humble yourself, right? So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God or in the presence of the Lord, as it says, uh, and he will lift you up. So as you think of that, I have to ask the question. Uh, there was a lot of motivation we just shared about why to stay humble. And remember, there are three ways he can exalt you is what we want to drive towards in this session. Because if he makes a promise to exalt the humble, I need to know how he's going to exalt me. And he doesn't go nebulous on that. He gets very specific in scripture of what he does with the humble. There's going to be three different ways. We're going to see that. Let's, uh, let's recognize on page 13, if you have page 13, I just want to read this for you. So let me read this, page 13. So the thesis here of this is that the difference in people's response to potential conflict is the degree to which they have biblical faith Okay, belief in what God has declared, motivating biblical hope, and the result in biblical humility because of their love for Christ. Let's just stop for a minute and understand that. If God makes a promise, if you humble yourself in my presence, I'll exalt you. You believe that. You have an expectation of good, right? Future good. That's hope. No matter what's happening now, if you believe that and you want that exaltation, that results in humility then, because the condition is humility. God says, if you're humble under me and you under my, your thoughts, your mind, everything about you stays with me in this conflict, I will exalt you. You believe that, you have hope. You have hope, you have humility, because that's the condition. So I would tell you that what's the difference between how people can handle conflict? Well, one way to say it is you don't believe God, or you do. Uh, you don't have a faith that motivates hope that leads to humility or you're stopping short. Maybe you just have faith, but you don't let it give you hope about the future in this context. And you don't let it lead you to humility. So let's do a little case study here you have in your outline, 13. Sue said, my husband has yelled at me again. Um, my husband has yelled at me again. Let me get this going here. My husband has yelled at me again for not keeping the house clean or for whatever, and for not staying on the budget according to his standards. So I left last night. I'm not going to put up with that. Surely God doesn't require me of that of me, does he? Well, where do we have to go to figure that out? The word. And someone who knows the word and loves the word more than they love you, but they love you. Matt comes to you and says, I've tried everything to get my wife to help, get help for her problems. I've prayed, I've tried to be nice, I've tried to compromise, but nothing works. I already tried that. It's her way or no way. She's impossible to live with. Does God really expect me to live the rest of my life being this unhappy? Answer, go, right? What does the word say? Right? Well, what do we know already from these people need faith, right? Without faith in Matt or Sue, they're not going to be able to please God. You're either, you have two ways to live. You can live by sight, make your decisions by what you see, what you feel, what others are saying, what you're reading in the tabloids today. Or you can live by faith in the word of God. That's your choice. You have two options. We live by faith. We walk by faith. Second Corinthians 5, 7, not by sight. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You have to believe he exists and that he's a rewarder. 
He never takes, but he doesn't give greater. Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself what? In love. That's your value. You want to know the most valuable people in the world? Faith. People with faith who express itself in love. And humble thoughts toward others are loving thoughts. You want to bring value to the world? And let faith produce hope, produce love and humility. That's the Christian life summed up. God, teach me what to believe so that I may have hope for the future, so that I may love recklessly in the present. You're going to take care of me, right, God? Yep. All right. Tell me what to do. May God give that kind of heart to us. What do we really know about these statements of, of uh, Matt and Sue? That they're in a tough circumstance, so we need to sympathize. Our high priest sympathizes with our weakness. If you just want to rush in there and tell them they're an adulterer, you're not ready. <laughs> a spiritual adulterer. You got to sympathize. You got to identify with their story. Even if you told it to what they need to do and they still are struggling, still sympathize to some level. You, maybe you've never been in a situation like that. Maybe God should put us all in that situation so we could sympathize better. huh? It's tough. You're only hearing one side of the story. Remember that. You must hear both sides before giving an answer. You need to try to get to objectivity to get biblical. Being objective in judgment seems you mean objective in facts. You have the facts, right? Before a matter is foolish. He who hears a matter gives an answer before he hears is fool. Yeah, Proverbs 18, 17, those verses right there. Both feel very justified. Realize that. Both Matt and Sue feel very justified in their reaction and want you to side with them. Okay? You must side with God and his word, though. Which side are you on? I'm on the Lord's side, which is on your side, whoever's doing God's will. You've got to love the word more than you love people if you're going to be biblical and help people. It's living by faith even as you counsel. What do you do? You need a biblical direction and you need to get one quickly. It needs to be biblical, clear, persuasive. And so the best one I have found for what I have seen in the transformation of the attitude of Surah Matt would be the humility of the tax gatherer. We're going to look at that. The humility of Jesus Christ and the expectation of the humble, which is exaltation. Those three things. Tax gatherer humility, Christ humility, and the expectation of exaltation. You, you get that in the heart and mind, little by little of Matt and Sue, you're going to have a new creature walking around responding to comfort very differently. You're going to have different focus. So it's a good starting place to get that center of gravity for them to build around. So this is just a statement I think is good to make. Humil humble thinking breeds unity in relationships. It's the bottom line. Because we have such differences. We have hurts. We're going to be suffering and we're going to have others suffer because of us, and because of them. You get those two people married, you're going to have sparks, you know, two sinners getting married. But humility will breed unity. But proud thinking will breed conflict. It's waiting for a conflict. What is proud thinking? Well, I'm going to give you one statement. I deserve you live, I deserve. You're going to have conflict. Proverbs 13, 10, pride breeds quarrels. One man came to me and he was having a hard time with his wife. And she was trouble. Uh, their second marriage, having trouble with the kids. And the son didn't feel comfortable in the home anymore because she was making it miserable on the son. And he said, Tim, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. He came to me. I tried that, I tried that, I tried that, I tried that, I stopped. I said, okay, I understand to a degree. I've never had a wife like that. So I tried to identify, sympathize. It's a tough situation. I don't know exactly, but I'm going to tell you something. I just want to check your, your humility pulse here, okay? I said, I, what do you deserve? And I, could, I knew he was a godly guy that was in the word. I said, do you deserve a better wife? I mean, I, I did. I was good with James here, getting right after it, right? Do you deserve a better wife? And again, I'm not telling you I'd handle this any different than you. I'm just telling you the truth, though. Let's get back to the foot of the cross. What do you deserve? And he looked at me and he said, 
nothing. I said, it's worse than that. <laughs> and he said, you're right. I deserve help. I said, no, I'm not telling you we don't address the issue with your wife. In fact, I want to get involved and talk to her. But your humility is critical for you getting grace to handle this. You don't go in saying I deserve and think you're going to get spirit's help. It doesn't work that way. You go in with the humility of the tax gatherer. You go in with the humility of Christ and you expect exaltation. That's the champions of Christian faith right there. Let's do it. You know, so you're bringing him to a place of what? Hope for humility and hope all together, right? It's not one or the other, it's both. Where do we find that motivation though to help a guy like that? In differences and disappointments and depraved moments, what do you do? Well, we're going to look at this. So let's just meditate on the story of the tax gathered and Jesus' example of humility and our own promise of exaltation. So Jesus told the parable uh, of Luke 18, 14 through 15 for uh, two purposes. What were those purposes? Um, no, let's actually say what those purposes are. If you want to turn in it, you can. Otherwise, I'm going to read it to you right now. It's Matthew. It's Luke 19. It's a very... Uh, very familiar passage uh, for some. If you've studied this, I have used this in counseling to uh, bring uh, people to a saving understanding of Christ uh, in the middle of conflict. What do you think of that, guys? The wisdom of salvation right in the middle of their conflict. One man coming to me said, uh, he was a, you've heard me tell this story maybe, but he was a Marine, retired, very proud man. Catholic background, wife, Catholic, but have becoming more, more uh, understanding of, of regeneration and now following the Lord in some really powerful ways. And uh, I just talked with him alone after talking with her because she said, I've got this problem. I said, well, let's see if you'll come in. I'll talk to him. So we did. Amazing. You know, and she was at a place of responding to the humility of Christ. She wanted to do what's right. So he came in. And I said, when you look at the cross, what do you see? But I went back first to this one, the, the tax gatherer. Let me read the story to you. Think about a man like that coming in, cold turkey. You know, he doesn't got a spiritual pulse in his body. But you've got the word that can renew him and give him life. And so here you go. You're diving in. Can you imagine this? I read this to him. Listen to this. I tell, uh, I'm going to start up at verse uh, 9. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Stop right there. The two purposes of this parable is what? To correct those who thought themselves to be what? Righteous. I'm better than you. And looked at others with contempt. You're less than me. And I looked at this man. I said, do you ever feel like that when you're in conflict with your wife? Because I have it with my wife. When the water's warm, come on in. And I look at my wife and I say, I'm better than you in this area. And I'm looking down on you right now. And so I'm going to have conflict. And I went on. The, the Pharisee and tax gatherer were two very different people. What do you see there? What do you see that? Look at verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Immediately that crowd knew what Jesus was talking about. Pharisee? Oh, you know. Wow. Amazing. Tax gatherer? Terrible dog, you know, get him out of here. Take your money. They take, give to Caesar some money in Rome and they double you your debt so that they get money too in the process. They get rich and the government gets rich and you get poor. A slander of Jews. They're not a fellow, but they're a traitor. And so they're, she's, they're listening to the story saying, well, that's, that's, Okay, good. We're going to talk about a Pharisee and tax gatherer. Good. Let's let those tax gatherers have it, Jesus. Speak against them. <laughs> He's not going to do that. But these are two very different people. And then they approached God in two very different ways. It's, it's a parable of contrast here. Look what it says. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed. Oh, that's right. Pharisees pray, those holy men. Now, this is what he prayed. Think about the Jews listening to this. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners like my, my boss or the government. 
it goes on to say unjust adulterers. Some women have been committed adultery against. They may in their hearts say, God, I thank you. I'm not like my husband who had committed adultery. See, this is, Jesus is trying to help sting us a little bit. Okay, stop looking down on others, no matter what the sin is. Because if you're better than them, it's because of what? Grace. Right? He goes on to say, like this tax collector. I, and then he, he, he confesses his right. He declares his righteousness. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off. So that's a contrast. A tax collector standing far off said something very simple. Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. I looked at that man and I, after I read that, I said, so is your wife more like the Pharisee? You got to start there first. Is your wife more like the Pharisee or the tax collector? What do you mean, like the one I, the Pharisees and tax collectors that we know of, or the ones Jesus is talking about here? You know, you can see it, it's a different contrast. It's, it's a, he's switching. And he, I think he shrugged his shoulders. And I said, Which one are you more like? Do you think you're better than your wife? Oh, no, no, no. Do you have conflict over things? Yeah. So when you have conflicts over things, don't you think you're better than her? Well, I guess so. Okay. So we keep going. The Pharisee and tax had received two very different responses from God. Look what it says in verse 14. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see the parallel here? So I want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus told it for two purposes. They're two very different people. They approach God in two different ways. One declaring his righteousness, the other declaring his unworthiness. And then God responds, making the unworthy one that de declares it worthy. And the one who thinks he's worthy, unworthy. Because the principle will hold true in salvation and in life that whoever humbles himself and admits their sin before God will be exalted. Now, the principle of humility before God is not just for justification through Christ, but it's also the way to get every need in your life met by God, the true needs, and receive help in your life, your circumstances, uh, and your relationship. I want you to think of that. I've had husbands come to me and wives come to me and say, Tim, when we hear the word and we hear the inspiration you give and the direction you give, we are ready to go. I'm ready to go. And then when I go home, my wife sucks the Jesus out of me, just sucks it right out of me. Wait a minute. Why did, why did that happen? Because he's hearing the word of faith here and maybe he's getting saved earlier in his life but he's not taking that word of faith to motivate humility and hope the rest of his life. If you allow someone to suck Jesus out of you, that's your fault. According to Isaiah, you know, what it says in Isaiah chapter 50, uh, I'm trying to remember where that's at. I had it written down here, but it says that I dwell on the high and holy place and among those who are humble and contrite in heart to revive the heart of the contrite. So when you lose humility, you lose strength, okay? When you stop being humble, it's wisest to do the humble thing in everything, always. You may not know what it is, but you know what the opposite is. Stay away from it. Don't offend. Don't defend. Don't do something that is clearly unbiblical. Wait in humility for God to guide you. Now, such humility before God can motivate Humility before others, vertical humility. God, I'm humbling myself for you will always lead to horizontal humility because God is love. God speaks to you to help others hear the aroma of Christ through you. And then have you ever had a tax gather experience in your life? That's what I want someone in conflict to begin to ask as they hear this story. I've ever come to the place where I recognize I deserve help. That is a humility that's known only to Christians, by the way. Only Christians. If I walked out here and asked people, 
do you deserve hell? Oh, yeah, you better believe I deserve hell. Now, what are they going to say? No, 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 I'm not that bad. Now, if you're saved here today, you know the answer to that. The wrath of God abides on you. One commandment broken, guilty of all, according to scripture. And murder to God is hatred in your heart or calling someone a fool. You ever driving a car in Miami? It happens, right? Don't it come out of you? What are you doing? Why are you beeping your horn at me? Light just turned green. I'm going to sit here just a little longer because you beeped your horn at me now. Don't do that. That's cut sinful conflict, right? Go ahead. Get out of the way. Do your best. Do you deserve hell? Take that into your conflict. That's what we're saying here. God has given you a gem called humility. That humility can change you and change those around you that God is saving. Don't leave it. Just because someone provokes you to be proud, no. Keep saying, what do I deserve? No, this ain't so bad. Now, does that mean I'm not going to deal with abuse? No, you still deal with certain things in a proper way, but not without humility. Humility alone is going to give you objectivity about, about the situation. You can't get it any other way. We're distorted. You know, we hear a lot of psychology about distortions. It's pride that distorts everything. It's humility that clears everything up. Oh, I am so sorry. Yeah, I shouldn't have said, yeah, you did that, but you sucked Jesus out of me because I gave you a straw to do it, you know? I shouldn't have given you the straw. I should have said, bit of give a blessing. You say, honey, I love you. I don't want you to leave the house. I want to do what's right here. Boy, it's hard to stay there though when you mistreat <laughs> I want to win you. Why do you feel I want to win? I want to please God. Where are you going to find this power? Tax gather experience. That's where you first find the power. If you've not had that, you can't learn anything else. So I'm about to say, but if you have learned that, let's move on. Jesus meditation on him of his humility. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. So here you have the tax gatherer, the worst sinner in the world, who becomes justified because of his humility. And here you have Jesus, who deserves all worship, humbling himself to the point of being a curse on a cross, and he's going to get exalted. Both are going to get exalted because of the humility that they have before God. The tax gatherer, repentant humility, and Jesus, obedient humility, right? You, you live with either repentant humility or obedient humility, and you will be exalted. And usually for us sinners, it's both. We're going to have both because usually we've probably done something or neglected something that would have helped it not be a conflict. But I did something. Please forgive me. And now you move into what does obedience look like here, which may entail speaking truth and love to that person. Now, here it is. Five steps in the humiliation of Jesus. We just celebrated Easter for that Good Friday. Jesus was humiliated in five ways. The father shows up, says to Jesus, I have a wonderful plan for your life. What do I have to do, dad? First, you got to step off your throne. Excuse me? <laughs> In your conflict, you often have to step off your throne. Well, I'm the man, or I've gotten the boss. I'm the one with greater ability than you. Step off your throne. Jesus did. He did not. Regard equality with God, a thing to be what? A thing to be grasped. He did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped. How humble an act is seen, not in how disrespectful someone's treated, but how much they deserved based on how they were treated. Now you know the, the humility of Jesus. He started as the very nature of who? God. Where are you starting in your conflict? Uh, I deserve hell. Okay, how high is that? You see what I'm saying? The Bible has wisdom for conflict. And it's tax gather humility first. But when you look at this statement uh, from Philippians 2 we're looking at, it's a song that the church used to sing, we think. 
God, Jesus, in the form of God, didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He started here and ended up there. The infinite distance between what he deserved and how he was treated. Colossians chapter 1, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created both in heaven and on earth. This is where he starts, guys. Visible and invisible. Everything created by him and for him. And in him everything exists. Every heartbeat of the one people at the cross was continuing because of his will. Think of that. When he's before all things. Matthew 20, though, says he was mocked. They pulled his beard. They crammed a crown of thorns on his head. They stuck a reed in his hand. They put a robe on him. They called him a king. They spit in his face. They mocked. They scorned. They ridiculed him. It's a pretty bad day. But here he is, the sinless son of God, being treated as the worst criminal, the greatest injustice because of where he was started and what he was treated. And what are we complaining about? Because his death, was not just an example for us. Let me go beyond conviction of, wow, I should be, I should feel bad about that. No, you should be expectant about that because that death meant you will not suffer in vain ever. Every pain that you ever suffer that you've the aroma of Christ, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to gain. We're about to get to those gains in a minute. We got to step off your throne. You got to let go of your rights. He emptied himself of all divine prerogatives, all divine prerogatives. John 5, 5, 19. Jesus answered and said, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the father doing. He can do nothing of himself. Think about that. The lowliness of mind in that action of father, I humble myself under your great plan for my life to step off my throne, let go of my rights, and then become their servant. He took the form of a servant. How hard is it to serve someone you're at enmity with, right? Do you have a pr- prayer as one way you can serve them? the Garden of Gethsemane, we can hear him praying. I don't want to do this. But I'm your slave. He's becoming a slave. He doesn't claim his rights. And he's becoming our servant. Can you see the progression here? Step off your throne, let go of your rights, and then get active in serving them. Think about that. Now, lastly, sympathize with their weakness. That may be the hardest step. You mean sympathize. I didn't say minimize their sin. I said sympathize with their weakness. Everybody has a story of how they got where they're at. You do too if you're in a good place. The grace of God wrote your story. The grace hasn't written their story yet. But God is putting grace in their life by how they're treating you. You're coming to them as a person of grace. What an opportunity. We have to hear that call. Sympathize with their weakness. Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them for what? They don't know what they're doing. Don't minimize the sin, but sympathize with the weakness. So the final step in this humiliation of Jesus is there was no breaking point. He became obedient to the point of, where do you draw your line? (laughs) All right, that's it. See what I'm saying? Jesus had no breaking point, no breaking point. You could have treated him even worse than that. It could have gone on for weeks, years, centuries, and he would not have broke. Do you believe that? He would have stayed there because that's how obedient he is. And that's how unobedient we are. We don't, when push comes to shove, we don't trust the father to exalt us. We don't trust the father to be with us. We don't trust the Father to be better than whatever we're losing. We don't. We forget God's goodness. And we sell our birthright for a satin pillow, you know, in conflict. Jesus' objectivity because he was humble. He knew what was valuable. He did it. So humble obedience for God is shown in sympathetically serving the welfare of others and even enemies above your own. And doing this to the point of death, even death on a cross. You still want to follow Jesus? <laughs> yeah. I would like to co- uh, declare holy war. How about holy war? Like James and John, the sons of thunder. Right? Now, what's the next verse say? Page 16. We need to meditate on our promised exaltation by looking at Jesus is here. 
For this reason, what reason? Because Jesus kept humbling himself. There was no breaking point. We bestowed on him every name that's above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will shout. So he was exalted above all names, even death. He victorious over. That's what we celebrated. Why was he victorious over death? Because of how he handled the cross. Cross plus obedience equals resurrection. Can we say it this way? A conflict plus obedience equals resurrection for you. You get changed. You get influencing others. You glorify Christ. Now, Peter was a fisherman. James, the brother of John, brother of Jesus. Here's what we have. First Peter chapter five. Peter, the fisherman, takes this story of the humility of Jesus, this promise of exaltation to the tax gatherer, and he puts it in living color day to day. I don't know if you've ever read the book of First Peter, but it's a book on suffering. Nero was blaming Christians for the burning of Rome and what ended up happening is they were being crucified. This is why a lot of Christians were crucified because of Nero. And so Peter says to them, look, this is happening to test your faith. And here's how he ends the book. Well, look at that. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that in due season, he will lift you up. Cast your anxiety on him, your stress on him. Don't bear that yourself. He will take care of you. He loves you. If you're going to go through suffering, you go through with a confidence in the love of Christ or you will not be able to stay humble. Okay. And then James echoes that. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. We looked at that earlier. So how was he exalted? And this is where we end today. And we'll pick this up maybe next time a little more detail. But I'm at least going to give you the answers. Okay. By the way, there's our little illustration. The husband is humbling himself in his expectation from God. Greater joy from God than his wife. He does want joy from his wife. But greater from God. God, will you exalt me? Not my wife, but will you? Will you help me? Here's the way God can exalt you. Ready? He can exalt you temporally. Look at these verses. In 1 Peter, you'll see these things. God can exalt you by uh, silencing the ignorance of foolish men by how you act. Just look at that verse. There's a cause and effect. God can exalt you by winning your spouse without a word from you. Just as how you act. He can do that. Didn't say he always will, but he can. Three, your opponents will be put to shame as they observe your good deeds. Like Paul was with Stephen. So there can be temporal exaltation moments in your life. You could have greater positions in church, greater positions at work greater finances. It, it could happen because of how you have integrity. Instead of your desires guiding you, your humility and integrity are, and God is exalting you wherever you go. There's a good man. Let's put him in charge like Joseph after he was mistreated. You remember that? Joseph mistreated. He handled it properly. And what happened? Second in command of Pharaoh. Wow. That's a temporal exaltation. Okay. God promises that and can do that. Look at this one. Um, the eternal exaltation. Jesus said, you'll inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5. He said, you'll rule, be ruler over much, Matthew 25, 21. But if I were to tell you the greatest way God can exalt you is internal. I dwell with the humble to revive their spirit. Nothing can take that away. John 14, Jesus promised this. If you love me, obey me. And Jesus, what? Well, my father will love you. I will love you. Imagine Jesus saying that to you. Well, I thought you already loved me. No, no. There's a special love when you respond to my love by loving me. I love all my children equally. But the ones that express love to me most, they get closest to me. They know my heart better. But I love them equally. But I will love you in a special way. Here's the special love. Ready? Hold on to your seats, fishermen, and will manifest myself to you. <laughs> like, scratch, scratch. Can you make us fishers of men? I like the eternal treasures part. What do you, wait. they got it later. The greatest good you and I can have is the disclosure of Christ to us more fully. You know that intuitively because when you meet someone great, someone you want to be with long time, there's nothing better than that. Can you imagine Jesus? How can God exalt us? Number one, he can make our enemies at peace with us. He can do that. He could give us eternal treasures ruling forever. 
faithful with a few now ruler or much. And he promises it. And, he, we, and we will be there. We will do that one day. Or second, third, he can also give us more disclosure of himself. He can let us know him better and become more like him. Right. And that is the greatest good. And the husband or the wife or the person in conflict that does that is getting that. So summary, what does the cross of Christ teach that we deserve? Yet what have we received? Why can Christians be humble because of that? Why does exaltation of Christ teach us what we receive? What does it teach us if we remain humble? If this has motivated you to be more humble toward the person you're in conflict with, then you have the potential for growth. To grow in this, you'll need to preach this to yourself in every difference, every disappointment, and every inconvenience. And I will tell you, that is what I try to do. Go back to the humility of the tax get, Tim. Go back to the humility of Jesus Christ, Tim. Go back to the expectation of exaltation, Tim. Now, figure out what is the right thing here. Oh, God, help us with this, right? Now, not this is not your stopping place in dealing with the sins of others, but it's your starting place and sustaining place. And next time we'll talk about where does this take us now in actually talking to someone who's in we're conflict with and involving others if we need to. Okay, let me pray for you guys and uh, hope you have a great Saturday. Father, thank you for this time. Use this uh, teaching to help us in our weakness. Uh, Lord, uh, so thankful for those who could be here today those online, uh, whatever's going on, Lord, help them to do the humble thing. Help them to remember those who love them most can be those who hurt them most, who can be then those who test them most, but then in the end can be those who help them gain most because it's the greatest opportunity for humility they'll have when they're hurt to deal with their sin against them the way you have dealt with them their sin against you. Father, help us to be humble. Help us to not idolize satin pillows when we have such a savior that can disclose himself to us. Help us to influence the Pauls out there who are yet to become Pauls by how we handle the conflicts in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So guys, uh, thanks for joining.